Every time you sleep near someone, are they influencing your dreams? or at a distance for that matter. What if I told you there's a hidden chapter in the annals of intelligence history that the CIA might not want you to know about? What would happen if you had access to all information from every other human brain through a new technology that is now being developed? Imagine, if you will, a world where the boundaries of perception are not confined to the physical senses. A world where the mind can traverse distances, peering into places unseen by the naked eye. This is not science fiction, it's the realm of remote viewing. Remote viewing is a practice that suggests individuals can gather information about a distant or unseen target through extrasensory perception, ESP. It's a tantalizing concept that challenges our understanding of consciousness and reality. The most important philosophy that human beings have ever developed has been science. The most powerful and potent tool has been the experiment. This is Michael Persinger, a prestigious doctor who has not only experimented with this technology, but has also played a significant role in perfecting and studying it. Michael Persinger was an American-Canadian professor of psychology at Laurentian University, a position he had held from 1971 until his death in 2018. His best-known hypotheses include the temporal lobes of the human brain as the central correlate for mystical experiences, subtle changes in geomagnetic activity as mediators of parapsychological phenomena. His work on paranormal experiences has received widespread media coverage, but has also been widely criticized. All the information of every human brain that's ever lived has the potential to be stored in the Earth's magnetic field with lots of energy left over. The science behind remote viewing. Remote viewing operates on the premise that human consciousness is not limited by space or time. The idea is that our minds can access information from any point in the universe, much like tuning into a radio frequency. This concept has been explored through various scientific studies, suggesting that under certain conditions, individuals can indeed describe details of distant locations without being physically present. The process involves quieting the mind and focusing intently on a target, allowing images and impressions to surface. These impressions are then interpreted and recorded. While skeptics argue that remote viewing lacks empirical support, proponents point to numerous experiments where viewers accurately described remote locations or objects. Knowledge is the ultimate power. When about 50% of the population becomes educated, that's when you have revolutions, historically. That's why people are often and dictators are often against literacy or access to free information. First of all, the control of populations is based upon a few having discretionary information over the many. Call them governments sometimes, or administrations. Economic advantage derives from proprietary information. If everybody had equal access and knew what the other person was thinking, do you think there'd be rich people? One fascinating hypothesis is that Earth's magnetic field plays a crucial role in facilitating remote viewing. Some researchers suggest that geomagnetic conditions can enhance or inhibit psychic abilities. During periods of low geomagnetic activity, individuals might experience heightened sensitivity to remote stimuli. This ties into broader theories about consciousness being interconnected through Earth's magnetic field, a vast network linking every brain on the planet. If true, this could mean that our thoughts are not entirely private, but part of a larger collective consciousness. The strength of the magnetic field induced in every brain, right now you're being induced, to put it this way, you're immersed in the Earth's magnetic field as penetrating through your brain, through your body, and in fact the strength of the magnetic field induced in every brain by the Earth's magnetic field, when all brains are considered, is almost identical to the strength that each brain generates. Calculations suggest that the time required for an event in one human brain to diffuse into all other human brains on this planet would be about 10 minutes. And it would recur primarily during dreams or during altered states when the right hemisphere is dominant. There's the representation of the seven billion brains, almost seven billion. And ultimately, this connection would take place over time in roughly about 10 to 15 minutes, particularly if you were dreaming because there's something very different about the right side of the brain, the right hemisphere. Now, has there been evidence that such connections occur? Yes, for decades, verified cases indicate that some people's sudden experiences about a crisis to or death of a loved one occurs on days when geomagnetic activity is quietest. This is an example of a geomagnetic uh, pattern recorded right here in our laboratory at Laurentian University. You can see the perturbations. This is a very active kind of night a geomagnetically active kind of period. On the other hand, on quiet nights, which is the next one, you can see the difference. In other words, when it's quiet, when it's geomagnetically quiet, the connections between all seven billion brains have greater possibility. When there's more perturbation, it's like having more noise in the system. Very weak effects, 
but very strong and emotionally significant impact. Training individuals to harness remote viewing involves enhancing their natural psychic abilities through meditation, visualization exercises, and sometimes even technological aids designed to stimulate specific brainwave patterns. The goal is to unlock latent potential within the right hemisphere of the brain, the seat of creativity and intuition. This is an experimental kind of study in where individuals who are dreaming in one room and simply engaging in ordinary dreaming in another room, a person is looking at a picture a target. And what we find, and this is the work done at the Maimonides Dream Hospital, or Dream Studies, what we found is that under certain nights, when you look at the dream content is exactly the, what the picture was, the person, the other person was looking at. Notice that the black circles indicate that when the geomagnetic activity was quiet, very, very quiet, that's when the dream content of the dreamer corresponded with the details of the picture upon which the other person was concentrating. Why don't these experiences occur more frequently? Or is your brain more like a television remote that is randomly changing channels and ever so often overlaps with the source? If I told you 200 years ago that I had a device that I could put to your ear and you could hear what was going on on the other side of the Atlantic, you would say that's crazy, but now we call it a telephone. If I told you 400 years ago that I had a device which allowed me to measure and represent your friend and I could play it back long after he was dead and you could see that person, you would think it was magic. That's called filming. Can the ability to access information at a distance be trained? And the answer is yes it is and we've trained it. One notable figure in this field was Ingo Swan, who worked with both scientific researchers and intelligence agencies to develop protocols for remote viewing. His work demonstrated that with practice and proper conditions, anyone could potentially access distant information. Ingo Swan was involved with the development of this remote viewing for the Central Intelligence Agency for the United States many years ago. Well, let me show it to you. He learned to identify experiences that originated primarily in his right hemisphere as pure images and experiences. Here are some examples while he was sitting in a closed chamber in a laboratory and asked to draw what experiment experimenters were seeing based upon random selection of target. The target was the experimenters had gone to see Science North. There's what he drew. That's what it looks like. This is all published in scientific journals, incidentally, and you can access them by simply Googling it on the web. He's still in the chamber. We're measuring his brain activity, and he begins to draw. Here's one for you. Deep feelings. Feeling of points or seeds, struts, electricity, feeling of awesome. What could possibly be drawn like that? The answer is a tornado. How close can you get? Now let's delve into a more shadowy aspect of remote viewing. During the Cold War era, Amidst fears of Soviet psychic research, the CIA embarked on its own journey into the paranormal. This led to the development of programs such as Project Stargate, which aimed to harness remote viewing for espionage purposes. In these clandestine experiments, psychic spies were tasked with gathering intelligence from afar. The results were mixed but intriguing enough to keep the program running for over two decades. Declassified documents reveal instances where remote viewers provided accurate descriptions of military installations and other strategic targets. Just remember Alexander Graham Bell, the first time he generated a signal across the room. It was scratchy, he could barely hear it, but the point is from that beginning of just a bit of information, now we have one of the most sophisticated technologies in the history of Western civilization. We have the telephone communication system. You've got to start somewhere, and then you perfect the technology. The implications of successful remote viewing are profound. If human consciousness can indeed transcend physical limitations, it opens up new avenues for intelligence gathering and warfare strategy. Imagine being able to access enemy plans or locate hidden assets without setting foot on foreign soil. However, this also raises ethical questions about privacy and consent. If such abilities were perfected, would there be any secrets left in the world? Would our thoughts become as accessible as our digital footprints? This is the same frequency that the entire Earth generates rates. His accuracy was less when there were geomagnetic storms and the Earth's magnetic field was disturbed. So if the magnetic field was disturbed, he lost the ability. There's an actual EEG. Back in the days, we only had three channels. Notice the red arrows. Those are seven hertz. This is a unique pattern. You don't find it very often. And the number of these patterns were directly related to how accurate he was. So in other words, the more he showed that activity over the occipital right hemisphere, the more accurate he was in terms of the information at a distance. There's the ionosphere, and of course, generating between the Earth's surface and the ionosphere is a seven hertz pattern. And the more you get closer to that pattern, 
the more you seem to have access to everything around the Earth. For example, that 7 hertz pattern not only has the same frequency as generated from the intrinsic aspect of your brain, your brain has a natural frequency. Guess what it is? 7 hertz. Based upon the fact that consciousness is recreated every 20 milliseconds, it's moving at about 4.5 meters per second. Let's do a simple calculation of the circumference of your brain. It's about 7 hertz. And the intensities of both the magnetic and the electrical components for both this and your brain are identical. I know you're thinking that this is really, really weak, but let me do an experiment real quick. Effectively, you're listening to me right now, and the sounds you're hearing are in the order of about a millipascal in terms of pressure. That's what you're listening, about 40 to 50 decibels, a millipascal. Right now, above you, there's over 100 kilopascals of pressure a billion times more pressure on your body right now than the pressure associated with me talking with you and you listening. Can you hear the atmosphere? It's a billion times more. Of course you can't. It's not the intensity. It's the pattern. The pattern is the critical thing. So never underestimate the importance of the pattern. Is there evidence of information transfer? We are now measuring photon emission from the human brain. That's how we think it's working. And you can see, if we take you, for example, and we ask you to sit down inside of a quiet room, and on the, the left hemisphere, the left side of the brain, right hemisphere, right side of the brain, notice that when a person is simply relaxing and just thinking about casual thoughts, for example, like something easy and refreshing, like how many hours I'm going to study tonight. On the other hand, if on the focus, you say, okay, now I want you to think of white light. Just think of white light. That's all you have to do. Notice the left hemisphere doesn't do anything. The right hemisphere, if you're relaxing, doesn't differ. The vertical axis is the amount of energy, and I can tell you what it is. It's about 10 to the minus 11 watts per meter squared. You can't see it. You need a machine, a photomultiplier tube to see it. But notice on the right hemisphere, when you ask a person to just think of white light, notice that under focus on the right hemisphere, there's almost a doubling of output. That's right, and now we know in neuroscience that it's very likely, Bokan and other people have actually shown this, that there's light emission from retina, that when you're actually thinking about white light, there's just not action potentials and neurons firing, there's actually photons being emitted within your brain. The minute you have photons, you have access to almost everything. That's entanglement. In other words, entanglement means that effectively, the minute you have two people connected, Photons here and photons here. We really don't know right now when that photon is flashing in the other room. Is it the same photon that shows up in the other person's brain instantaneously? Or there's simply entanglement. But if you have entanglement, you understand what that means. That means you have information at a distance. Already physicists are doing this. They call it teleportation because they're a bit more dramatic. They've already done it up to over 100 kilometers. Change the polarity on one, the other one changes instantaneously. That's the first stage to having information from everywhere. The brain is matter. It's based upon the physical principles of the universe. And if you have that capacity to imagine it, that means the potential is there for it to be done. Because our brains are reflective of the essential aspects of the matter of this universe. As we stand on the brink of new technological advancements, one must ponder, what does the future hold for remote viewing? Will it remain a fringe pursuit relegated to paranormal enthusiasts, or will it become a mainstream tool for intelligence agencies? Moreover, if we reach a point where accessing information remotely becomes commonplace, how will society adapt? Will we embrace this newfound transparency as a step towards global unity, or will it lead to further divisions as privacy becomes an antiquated notion? In conclusion, Remote viewing represents both an exciting frontier in human potential and a profound challenge to our current understanding of reality. As research continues and technology evolves, we may find ourselves living in a world where secrets are relics of the past, a world where knowledge truly knows no bounds. Thank you for watching. If this video resonated with you or added value, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Until next time, keep listening, keep growing, and keep shining. Stay blessed.